My goodness, I am so excited to be here with Francesca Lin, who is a, an associate professor now at the University of Commonwealth, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU. We were just talking a little bit about that in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Welcome, Francesca. Hi, it's really nice to be here. This is really cool. Yeah. I am so excited. I just like want to learn everything about you. And um, let's start with how you got into comic studies. Okay, yeah, this is um, this is cool because it was kind of like a lot of things I didn't know were happening while I was kind of searching for what I wanted to do. Um, first off, I always liked I've always liked comics, but maybe not even like as as a kid I wasn't like a serious collector or one of those people that was really into it I was more of like a like a casual reader of things like the Sunday funnies and then moving into um I think my big love which I've, I've noticed um at least other women like around my age age group like we also we have this common thing that we really like the Archie comics or like Betty and Veronica and things and I remember really liking them just because like there was something that like, you could get at like the supermarket and like my mom would like buy them for me and then after that I remember getting um really into more like mainstream superhero stuff particularly like X X X-Men um I think were my first love of kind of looking at like single issues and that kind of thing but I um I really got into like learning about comic studies um, when I first kind of, um, I had no idea really, um, that University of Florida was like such a great place for comic studies, even though I went there until like way later, like after I graduated kind of, um, from undergraduate, um, and then, um, kind of learning about that. It was really kind of easy to like know and kind of get into that through um, through that association and also through a place called the Sequential Arts Workshop um, in Gainesville, um, which is actually a more of a like a cartoon conservatory where you like learn how to make comics. And it's a really, really great place where you can get like a really high quality education on like kind of the craft of making comics and writing stories and all of those things. Um, but while like not spending a ton of money. So I took actually adult cartooning classes there. Um, but I didn't really start kind of writing about comics in, um, in an academic sense until I was in my like, PhD program here at Virginia Commonwealth University. Before that, I had done like a little bit of things like comic reviews and kind of book review type things. Um, for um, primarily for a website called the Com uh, for Comics Bulletin because I had um, a few friends that wrote for that publication and that was like, a really great experience. Um, I kind of initially did that just to get free access to like more comics um, to read because at that time I think I was like, really really broke and the, but that was a really really awesome way of kind of learning a little bit without knowing, like I didn't know anything about like theoretical approaches to visual rhetoric, but it really helped me kind of learn about visual analysis and like kind of take take it really slow and like learn about things like composition and how comics are made and all of those other things. And so I'm really like grateful for that, for that experience. <laughs> I don't know if any of those reviews were any good. Though. Yeah, oh, no, I've read them, they're great. Um, maybe not all of them, but some of them, they're <laughs> yeah. No, it's really important for us to have that, um, you know, to to be writing for kind of bigger audiences. And, um, you know, I think, you know, doing those kinds of comic reviews is a way to keep us kind of on our toes. Right. Um, so let's hear about this, like, really, like, kind of deep, important body of research that you've been doing uh, that you've done on fragmented bodies, trauma and women of color comics. Okay, yeah, so this idea of the fragment, fragmented body, um, of course I didn't make that up. Like it's kind of like a Lacanian gesture towards like this idea of like talking about things like, um, and I won't go too much into this because I feel like I feel like then I sound like, like a grad school theory sem seminar about it, you know what I mean? Um, but like, but like um, when going back to things like talking about the mirror stage and development and talking about um, the recognition recognition of self um, what I really um, kind of took from this idea of the way people represent themselves because that was what my research was centered on it was uh, about um, 
autobiographical comics of people that are like reflecting on their own lived experiences. In doing so, um, in all of these, people have to draw your own, they have to draw their own bodies, their representation of their bodies um, over and over again in ways that I think um, allow for these cre creators to make visible and present like fractured, fractured versions of the self, um, which can be a product of tra traumatic fragmentation. So in that, I'm really talking about this idea of traumatic memory. Um, in general, the way we understand memory, um, which I could go on forever, I really, I, I love thinking about like the different ways, conceptually, like biologically, and kind of the way maybe even the scientific narrative of memory has changed. But we understand memory to be not, not static. Memories aren't typically fixed within our minds, but like traumatic events, surviving a traumatic event, experiencing a traumatic event, um, for kind of further shift and reposition these memories, um, which also helps us kind of understand the way trauma has such an unknowable qu um, quality. So like traumatic memory can um, look really differently. Like it can be asynchronous, like your events are not co coordinated in time. And um, so there's like all of these specific conceptual challenges, but then there's also like this, this, this conceptual challenge in like how you represent like maybe a body that has gone through trauma. Um, and in this, I'm talking not just about like physical trauma, which does happen in a lot of these memories, but also like how um, maybe a body by, of a woman is thought of in a very different way than maybe some other bodies are in ways that can be traumatic, um, but also the way that, um, you know, um, bodies by people of color, particularly women of color, are, um, are thought of within our society. And those bodies marked as difference can be a kind of trauma in, the, in and of itself. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> but um, and so that's one of the things I'm, I'm thinking of. So not just maybe um, the um, account of um, a, a, like, for example, turning in Japanese, which is another kind of trauma. There's a, a, a really important sequence, I think, of um, Marie Naomi um, feeling that there's something very, very wrong physically with her body um, throughout, throughout it something very physically is wrong. She doesn't know what's happening. And there's all these different depictions of like how much weight she's losing and what's happening. It turns out to be a very, very severe um, case of salmonella poisoning. So that is like a trauma that is represented. And that is, um, I think, really important to look at, I think, too, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, um, maybe even like gestures towards like um, the co the connection and inseparability of like the body and the mind, for ex example. But I'm looking at that. But I'm also looking at the way the body is um, the body is raised and gendered in a way that can be traumatic. So like the perception of other pe people, and then the way that someone can depict themselves within um, within these like memoirs in a way that is maybe either depicting that or defiant towards that, which um, I think they're both, they both can sometimes be do, be doing that simultaneously. And that's, that to me is like some of the fascination of like magic of the comics, right? It's like, yeah, it's so exciting. Yeah, wow, so amazing, uh, Francesca. Um, when, if just kind of, you know, thinking off the cuff here with Linda Berry and Belle Yang, how how do you see their work kind of fitting within or or complicating um, the this little this, this brief discussion you have of uh, turning Japanese? Oh yeah, that's a really good way of maybe thinking about it. That really makes me think of, and I don't know if I even really wrote about this in the dissertation because I was you know in preparing for this talk I was like relooking at this again and parts of it I was like hey parts of this are pretty good and which is a nice surprise look at and then other things I was like oh I didn't include include this, but I'm like, oh, this is why you revise something like this to make a book eventually. But I was thinking about when um, I remember showing um, the 100 Demons to another scholar and they were like, oh, she draws her, she draws her people like, and they're kind of like ugly. 
And I was like, and I really never thought that. And I was like, I don't think these are ugly people. But what this scholar was really talking about and was really interesting was of the way of maybe um, deploying something like the grotesque in telling a story and especially telling, and I think lots of other women cartoonists have have done this, not just women of color, but in, in kind of the greater, greater like kind of landscape of women cartoonists have maybe made their their people maybe somewhat more monstrous even looking when which in a way I was like oh I guess like it's because I don't think like you know monsters are necessarily ugly in the same way because it's so subjective but in the same way that this is maybe a refusal to um to rely like solely on maybe stereotypical um, uses of what is considered beautiful. Cause I was like, I love Linda, like all, like I think these people are beautiful, but this idea of, um, of maybe challenging that I think is really, really important for Bell Yang. I think, um, I think that, what is fascinating about um, kind of the Yang Forget Sorrow book is maybe some of more of the um, of the depiction of things like stress being um, like emotional stress because there is a very like you know it's a, a longer narrative about her father. If people have not read this one, because I think that Bell Yang is maybe less of a known name sometimes when we're talking about um, comics and cartooning. It's one that you should definitely read. Um, it, it's a longer kind of narrative of, of her father and her father's family that she's telling. But there's also it's kind of within a frame story of her um, having to move in back in with her parents after being a survivor of intimate partner violence. And um, this man is also like kind of threatening and stalking her. And so that's always like kind of on the edges, but she is a really like, I think fascinating way of depicting, like there's a sequence, for example, of a nightmare. There are like moments where you can tell it's not, it is, she has a way, I think, which comics can do this. And and all of these women do this in their narratives. They never um, have to be like, oh, this is a thing that's just in my mind, or this is a thing that happened in my body. It is understanding, and I think in more of a way that we have informed, even by like looking at um, like the way trauma is processed, not just in the mind, but through the body, and those things we really can't um, distinguish. All of these women kind of do man, um, find ways of doing that in a way that I think comics are pretty unique because you can you can be like depicting something visually and you know putting the layer of the words on it in a way that I think is not not it's it's not confusing at all to the reader um, because I think we all under I think that we all understand this, but the way that sometimes it's delineated becomes like very muddy. Cause sometimes people will say things like, Oh, it's just stress. It's just in your head. But then it's like, but then is anything really just in your head? Like what, what like physical manifestations. And I think we're maybe, maybe some of us are seeing it all now too, cause we're all at home all the time. And there are people that are very, very tense and realizing how it is, impacting your physical health in ways that we can't really like you can't really think just think your way out of it and be like okay I'm going to put my mind away from it but your body our bodies don't really work like that and I think all of these women show different ways of maybe working through it and talking about this wow thank you Francesca so so deep so important to your work there um I know you've also done uh, some work here theorizing the panel border as a kind of you know within borderlands theory and i'm fascinated by this and i know our viewers listeners will also be fascinated by by this work can you share some of that sure and this is like one that i'm like I don't know when this is going to happen and have to, I'm like, I need to go back to this because this is like the most, I think, um, and a lot of this, again, I did not make this up or anything. A lot of this is um, really looking and, and looking again really closely at uh, like the, I don't know, this is, she's one of my like, I think academic heroes of all time, it's Gloria Ansel Dua, and looking at these, these concepts of border of borderlands theory. And of course, um, when Ansel Dua was originally kind of writing about these things, she was talking a lot of about like you know this uh, I don't I don't even know what to call the U.S. Um, the U.S. Mex Mexico border because it's like it's like 
imaginary board like because what is that when like it used to you know the united states used to be you know all part of and so it's but she she of course was talking about this at that time but um even within her writing is talking about how there are people that live within the borders there are people that live within a, a, a border lands because the border is not this like fixed place that maybe we maybe some people would like to think of or um you know this um but it is is a place that is um, really, really, um, really, really like a fertile place of knowledge. And um, Ansel Dua also kind of talks about this like trauma of a border um, and like that this idea which we can start maybe making connections even to this idea of double consciousness, um, but this idea that like as a result of this traumatic experience um, that we could like have this capacity to kind of like see in multiple angles to um to see beyond i think i believe she calls it like like surface phenomena um and so that's like one thing that i really kind of like started to look at and um i like that we included kind of this nod towards like uli lust today is the last day of the rest of your life because this memoir is a lot about like traveling and coming um coming across coming back and forth between certain borders as well as um which we can kind of also think of this greater memoir of um a lot of this narrative is about like moving from like say childhood to adulthood and so i'm like really really interested in that um as well as kind of looking at not just like this as the border as metaphor, but looking at the actual panel borders themselves within a lot of these comics and seeing the ways in which people um, maybe challenge this idea of a border between panels. Maybe um, maybe they're using the panel borders in ways that are novel towards their storytelling and kind of looking at all of those things together. Yeah. Yeah, really, really amazing. And also, you know, thinking about kind of the the panel border possibly as both kind of wound space, but then also a space of kind of healing and inclusion, right? Right. Yeah, that's yeah. And that is a really, really, um, a really, really, I think really like useful and productive way of looking at it it's also maybe a way that starts to um in some ways like not contradict but like maybe push against um this idea that um and i mean like the lead the man the myth the legend scott mcleod talks about closure which is such a and understanding comics is such a i think useful book to look at if you're looking at any kinds of, of comics but just because we have this maybe one con conception of closure doesn't mean that there aren't other ways and nuances of looking at looking at maybe what, how these panel borders are conceptualized i know and i know probably plenty of other scholars have published way more things about this than i have but by looking at maybe um the panel borders is something different than like oh the panel borders where you fill in the blanks of what happened in between but maybe trauma theory is suggesting that like that memories can be kind of fragmented and memories can be like kind of looked at in little snapshots or little moments. And there is no necessarily, there is never gonna be a recovered memory that happens between the two. There is not gonna be that, um, that like kind of connection. Then, then maybe these comics are not representing something that we have to fill in any blanks for, right? Then maybe we're not looking at like the goal of like, you know, kind of recovery, like the goal sometimes is thought of as like, oh, we're going to recover all these traumatic memories once you are like, I don't know, better or you figure things out. But maybe the, 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 the end goal is not recovering every last memory of every traumatic event, maybe the end goal is looking at consolidation and being able to um, like view this as a totality, totality without being um, a, you know, being what this other kind of, I don't even know what complete would be. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So important. And it's also, it's a kind of a demand somehow that the periodic table of kind of formal comics um, techniques or periodic table of concepts and techniques be kind of revised, right? Uh, different questions, different kinds of comics demand that, you know, we bring different sets of tools. Um, you've 
kind of answered this already a little bit, but yeah, autobio comics and why. And of course, I put Gabrielle Bell here because I think she seems particularly exciting for you. Yeah, I think Gabrielle Bell may be um, one of my favorite living cartoonists. Um, she, yeah, and maybe, and, and probably like one of my favorite cartoonists of, like, of all time. I think she is, um, what, I think she's fantastic. Um, I think that there is an, an insistence on her work of, of, of being, um, very, very, um, challenging in ways that I really always, like, admire. Um, plus she's also just, like, I think, like, some of these things, and I don't know if this is the way that she thinks about her work, I think that she's, like, one of the funniest, like, one of the funniest cartoonists that I've ever read. Like, it's just, it's so funny and so well written, but, um, so that's, I mean, that's just me, like, just, like, loving her work, but, I've always been interested in um, autobiography uh, in general. I love um, autobiography of like all sorts of different forms. I like, I love, um, you know, I love just reading memoirs that are um, memoirs that are about people that, that people have written that, especially if they're about like a difficult person. Um, I think of um, a lot of this idea of um, autobiography, a lot of the way that we think of autobiography, especially more recent things, um, it's a very American genre. Like it's a, uh, it's a very, when I was trying to, I remember like trying to learn about this and I was like, oh, this is like 10 dissertations by itself because I, I don't really come from like an um, English lit, an English lit background of being like, oh yeah, like what's a, like, what are these seminal autobiographies that we think of? And people were like, oh, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin and all of these other ones. It's a very, very like almost like characterized by Americanness in a lot of these autobiographies because they are, a lot of these ones, especially these ones by men are about an exceptional, an exceptional person chronicling their life. Um, but if you go and kind of look at what the autobiographies of a lot of women, particularly women of color, but um, also, again, not always, a lot of autobiographies, especially American autobiographies by women, although, of course, there are, like, you know, the Hillary Clintons the, in the world, too, too, that are maybe talking about exceptional. exceptional. A lot of the autobiographies that um, I was coming across were more about women um, kind of uh, talking about their identity and placing their identity within like an intersectional um, experience, which I thought that that was really fascinating. So they were maybe less about like being like, this is this great thing that I did and more about like, hey, this is what's, what's what was going on in the world and this is how I reacted to it and this is how like I navigated that. And I like, and uh, that kind of blew my mind. Of course, there are exceptions. But um, I think of someone like Gabrielle Bell, who is talking about everyday things, and I can't get enough of it. But a lot of it, I think it's because she's talking so much, trying to navigate her own identity, and also linking it to like, linking it to so many different things. It's always so multi layered. But then also she managed to do these things that I was like, this feels like um, I'm, I'm thinking and looking at, at things that she's interested in, like, you know, avant-garde film, for example. But then I'm also like laughing because it's so funny. And it's just like, I don't know how to, I couldn't do that with a paper. Like, I don't know how, how, how to do that, but she can do that in six panels. Like, so that to me is like endlessly fascinating. Yeah, no, you're right. Those, um, we, when we discover those creator storytellers um, that just like blow your mind and you're like, okay, kind of just up the game. How's, how am I gonna, you know, where am I gonna find this and how am I gonna kind of step up to this? Um, you, you also, uh, the, I'm thinking of the comics art, co arts collection there um, where you are, but yeah, the significance of the archive for women of color comics. Yeah, I think that's super fascinating. I um, am lucky enough to know a lot of other scholars that are, are working in and kind of talking about um, the problem of the archive or, or interested, especially the archives of women. Of women. Um, yeah, um, Rachel, Rachel Miller is always the person that I have to like mention with that because her um, just 
being able to talk with her and think about her um, work on kind of like aspects of even archiving or or um, cataloging girlhood um, had, was really, really kind of influential um, to me and to kind of thinking about um, things like I'm, I, I now, you know, I'm gr really grateful of knowing so much about things like zine culture from, from so many other scholars, because these are things that sometimes are not as collected. I'm really, really lucky that um, that um, the zine, there's a, a whole zine collection at the um, Virginia Commonwealth University, but I think the arch archives are a challenging place um, for people, particularly marginalized people. Um, and I think that sometimes um, archiving kind of women of color, um, that there's sometimes, um, or archiving women in general, there is like an interventionist model at play where like it usually takes a scholar like asking kind of questions like if they see an archive and it's mostly, um, you know, one type of person, um, they could ask something like, like, where are the other people? Like, where are the women? Um, and then also this idea of where are the women of color? Um, and, or for me, it was like, where are the women of color that made work about their own lives? Like, where are they? Because I, I just can't believe, like, because sometimes people would say things to me like, well, there's a lot of people now, but this is like kind of a new thing. And I'd be like, there's no way that like no women of color drew something and wrote about it and like something that we maybe call comic before like 19, there were just none before 1990. Like that's, that's, that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and I mean, I thought it was really important that I kind of try and look at this because even most of my works that I centered on in my dissertation were works um, kind of on like that came out more in the 2000s. Um, so, but I still thought I was like, it's really important to kind of write this dissertation and not act like this was, all of a sudden, like they were here. And um, so I, um, I think that this like kind of interventionist model is really important because we wouldn't, we wouldn't know about some of these people. I'm thinking about like Trina Robbins kind of being the person that was like, hey, these are women cartoonists. Um, and, um, but the drawback of this is that it kind of presumes this canon of all men from the beginning. So it's been really important to, for me to like talk to other people and, and, and kind of see where we can challenge our, um, dis, our, um, our like kind of assumptions. Like I'm thinking specifically um, like Margaret Galvin um, who found a lot of like lesbian cartoons within like kind of lesbian like underground papers for example for instance so then these were not like ones that were necessarily in a comics collection right they might have been in lgbtq collections but then it would take someone a scholar like her that would be aware of those things to be able to like bring them and introduce them into the canon um another kind of maybe way of looking at some of these things are um you know um the way that maybe certain things that were created by women that we would call comics now were not considered comics at the time of their publication. And so those things have been maybe changed and thought about differently. Um, I'm thinking about Mene Luko's memoir, which um, I think in the original publication called it like a memoir with pictures. And now like every subsequent publication now kind of calls it like a graphic memoir or even a comic in, in, that, in that kind of context. So then if we start to see this as a comic, we not only see because this, uh, this is a comic memoir that predates um, something that we know is very, very important. It predates Mouse. Um, so then if we see that then like the first maybe longer full length or one of the first longer full length kind of comic memoirs is not only like another comic memoir about a traumatic gen like generational uh, experience, but one created by a woman of color. And that kind of maybe starts to change the way we approach this whole idea. Wow, yeah, no, completely. And of course, um, I mean, you know, I'm right with you. And this is kind of exactly why I've been, you know, d deep diving into the kind of Latinx comics archive, right, to, to um, trouble this presumption of an all white male canon. Um, yeah. I just, and I love what you're doing, Francesca, I really yeah. do. 
It's because it is fascinating because I'm wondering too why some people get maybe, and I think it might be because they don't necessarily always create primarily comics. Like Belle Yang is a really good example. Belle Yang, um, you know, is a visual artist and um, her, her Forget Sorrow is definitely a comic, but a lot of times she gets left off of some of these things. I think because maybe it's a lot of her things are prose or they are um, illustrations accompanied by prose. But I'm like, that's interesting that we like are like, oh, just because she doesn't mostly make comics, um, it is it, like this one's left off. I also think maybe people have not created as much are sometimes like left like left out of this um, when we're thinking about especially comics that are depicting things like um, like the civil rights movement or tensions between um, different groups. I'm thinking even of like Lila Quintero Weaver's um, comics and that, and I was like, a lot of times, like, I was like, why is this not on, this should maybe be on more syllabuses. Like, this is definitely a comic. And um, I think it's maybe because of like, even like within communities, there are still outsiders, even in, with, with comics and cartooning. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Leela's work too. And she's, I think she's over there with, um, in, I want to say Richmond. Um, I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. She's over in your neighborhood somewhere. So I not remember, me, but I remember writing her like an email when I first started, started it because I, and because I talk about her in my dissertation and I, because I thought her work was phenomenal and I love her work. And, um, and she like sent me like bookmarks with the book on it. And I, it was the nicest thing ever. And I'd like, not, we've never met in person. So I need to maybe just email her and be like, hello, we can like wave at each other from a distance or something. That is amazing. Yeah. yeah I, know, I know she'd love to, uh, if you're teaching one of her books ever, I know she'd probably love to talk to your students and <laughs> all sorts of really cool things. Um, so Francesca, you um, tell me how this sort of synergy works with you and your creative uh, creation of comics, your creativity itself, and your scholarship. Um, and I don't know, maybe like, I mean, you've already shared so many insights, but is there anything in particular that kind of just you know, grounds you as a creator in your scholarship or vice versa? I think, um, I didn't really, I didn't really used to think that there was like very much connect of uh, connection, but I think, um, I am like always really interested in, um, stories that are very like centered on like a lived experience even if it's a lived experience that maybe has fantastical elements i'm thinking of like flower girls which i did not do the artwork sally cantorino did all of the artwork for it i just wrote it um but this idea too of um it, and that one that story is definitely maybe informed by these this idea of trauma and getting over trauma um so i think that that is like a huge a huge thing that i'm talking about i've done a little bit which is like depicted in the slide I've done a little bit of autobiographical work I feel like I like never want to do that ever again because I just I'm just like oh my gosh I can't I it, give it it that really um in terms of informing my scholarship that really gave me a greater appreciation of people that are doing autobiographical work so I'm just like um even if I could draw really really well uh and practice I'm like this would still be so hard just to just to tell the story and to like to to maybe kind of step outside and try and figure out how people um choose to depict and tell their stories is such a it's such a valuable learning experience and so and i i really think that like anyone who's writing about comics even if you're never going to show anyone you should try and make some and you should try and make some because it'll make um your um your scholarship so much better like to just to be able to maybe um start to even think of the practical concerns as to why someone might do that i think it's really really valuable because um these are like real things that a real person made that are physical materials. There are cultural products that are physical materials. And to kind of think about that, I think will only make your scholarship like that much richer. So that's, that's really cool. I'll, I'll probably always try and make things. Um, a lot of them are real bad. And I just kind of, I kind of like, like making things that are like real bad and real ugly and it's like, whatever, I'll never show anyone, but it's like, I feel like I am like kind of learning as I go. 
Yeah, you know, when I was talking to John Jennings um, in another one of these uh, podcasts, um, you know, he thinks of himself as a critical maker. And I, I love that, that term because it seems to capture so well, like what you do, Francesca, what John does, what others are doing, you know, in the scholarly realm to kind of really open the space, the breathing room in and around making, but also kind of cr the, the critical aspect as well. Yes. And I mean, yeah. And I was like, well, one day I'm just going to learn how to draw hands. <laughs> That's what's holding me back. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember every, not like, you know, if you talk to Jaime Hernandez, he's like, I cannot draw horses. And I'm like, you know, and, or animals. And he's like, but you know, you just figure out ways to kind of fudge it, you know? Um, <laughs> I think um, yeah, hands and cars. <laughs> Um, so you teach too, of course, yeah. and we've talked a little bit about that, I think, at the beginning, but um, or maybe when we weren't recording um, there at VCU, Gender, Race, and Comics, and Gender and Comics, and I'm sure other courses um, that you're, you know, down the, down the road. Um, can you share, like, the Francesca Lynn, I don't know, trademark approach to teaching comics? Well, yes. And I also think um, it's important to mention, I also teach, and I love teaching this, I teach um, the intro to gender studies um, classes. I teach a couple of sections of that. And what's really awesome about that is we, um, we get a lot of um, freedom to like, you know, construct our syllabus. And I try to always also incorporate comics, especially nonfiction comics within that as well. And the response from my students about how that knowledge is kind of um, is kind of very thoughtfully laid out, and the um, by comics that are nonfiction, particularly um, definitely have to kind of name check the nib, talking about some of the same issues that we're reading in our textbook, and being able to be like, oh, this is a comic that is that created by, um, for for instance, um, this is a good one because it overlaps with my other studies. Is this is a comic created by Whit Taylor that's talking about um, racial bias in, he in healthcare, and she's talking about um, things like black mothers within the U.S. and what the health outcomes are. Um, being able to like provide that alongside the other readings has been amazing because it is that students love it and they are excited and, and they say like this is easier to read but I'm like but I always challenge them I'm like it's easier to read but like do you feel like it's dumbing it down for you like do you feel like it's because and they're like no it's it's more memorable because of these visuals it's more it's in a lot of ways they're like it's more calm they're like we don't understand what's happening it's like more complex but it's easier like I <laughs> and and they are really really receptive to that and I think that's really cool because it's really talking um it starts to talk to them about things like visual rhetoric and how um and how sophisticated because some of these things sometimes when we're learning all these concepts especially in a 2000 in a 200 level class where they're getting they're learning some, a lot of things all at once and sometimes it is very dense information and it's complicated um and they they maybe sometimes get to get a little overwhelmed feeling but this reminds them I think in some ways that they are used to parsing lots of complex information visually all the time that they can talk through these ideas and how like sophisticated of a, of a talent and skill that that is already so that that's like one thing that I really love kind of stressing and doing but then um, as far as teaching comics um, within the upper level classes I try and um, do kind of some of the same things. Um, this semester I have also, I had them do as kind of, and this, these counted more as they're a very low stakes assignment, but I had them do some of the Ivan Bernetti's um, um, cartooning um, theory and practice book as assignments. Um, so they are these, I do not teach a class where that's like how to draw, how to cartoon, how to tell stories even. Um, but I thought it was really important for them to understand comics and approach them as things that like someone would actually have to draw. And why does abstraction work? Why is it so effective? How can we, why do we like, why do we have such an affinity towards certain, like maybe even comic book characters or um, they, they're also allowed to write about things like animation or animation 
animated characters? Um, in what methods do other people deploy that we can compare to? And some of that in involves like actually drawing, which I thought was really, really great. I um, definitely am informed by teaching from, by looking at kind of um, lots of different scholars, like Paulo Freire is like a huge, a huge thing for me. Um, taught, like kind of meeting students where they're at already is a huge thing for me. Um, and that means kind of um, assuming that they have a lot of knowledge already and they do. And so I think comics is wonderful in that way that they, they can start relating and on the ground running really quickly. And then they, but they still kind of understand even people that maybe don't have a huge experience. I think sometimes people will take my class and they'll be like, but I don't like, I'm not like a big comics person, but then I start to talk to them about it and they're like, Oh, but I read like, I was, but I read these like comics, like Calvin and Hobbes. They think like only like if you like you knew you knew about like some very serious um, you know memoir work that's like five thousand pages long. You're like a real comic scholar. But I'm like no, but like let's look at these comic Calvin and Hobbes. Let's look at this. Um, it's like oh, you watch Adventure Time. Okay, wh why are we talking about this? Especially because I am relating a lot of these things to things like um, gender theory. Um, queer studies, uh, feminist theory, and they are seeing a lot of these things play out um, within a lot of the contemporary works they're already looking at. So that's that's something that I love. I love the pop culture reference. Um, my students probably get so sick of me um, to, trying to relate things back to pop culture, um, but I think that's really, really relevant. And also I try and um, my, I think my challenge is always to mix um, what visual rhetoric and the way that we can kind of um, develop our kind of visual analysis skills with like looking at things like the plot and what the story is. That's always, I think, a challenge with comics and writing about comics. And then also I really strongly believe that these, um, the upper level classes should have at least some components in it that are self-directed. So our, my finals are always something that, um, I expect like the students to be able to write a proposal and tell me what they would like to step, to kind of cap off as their final, rather than me being like, you have to do this or you have to write an essay about this. And I also have an option for a creative, a creative final, um, which could be a comic or cartoon, or could be, I've also gotten things like, like students have made like, a, they made like kind of a short podcast or they made like a YouTube video or something like that related to comics, or they did, um, you know, uh, some sort of like, real, like infographic on cosplay, for example. Yeah, those are really great. Um, thank you, Francesca, for sharing some of those. They're really great ideas. Um, um, and uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to borrow some of those. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, you should. <laughs> you should. Um, speaking of meeting your students where they are, um, um, let's talk about audiences more generally and this caged and engaged and, you know, teaching by other means. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I think that with, I guess, if people don't know this, I, I do stand-up comedy. I've done stand-up comedy for a few years now. I feel like my students are um, generally to try to ask me anything about stand-up comedy, even if they've seen. I've had one student go, oh yeah, we saw that you're on a flyer, but we didn't think that you would want us to ask, so we like never asked. And I was like, if you all go to my show, it's fine. But like, I, I also think that like students um, are not thinking about what their professors are doing outside of the classroom. I think they think we just don't exist. So it's, which is kind of fine, because for a while I just like didn't tell anybody. But like, yeah, my stage name is just my actual name. So it's like not a secret. Um, but I started Cajun and Rage, which is a Zoom open mic that happens twice a month um, now. Um, during the, basically during kind of a couple months into the pandemic, um, typically within Richmond as a comic, uh, as a comedy scene. Um, yeah, it's also very, it's also very confusing to everyone that I do stand up comedy, but I teach about comics. Um, so I just like to be confusing, I guess. Um, but there were a lot of op open mics. Um, Richmond has kind of like a growing and burgeoning, like kind of 
stand-up comedy scene um you could go and do like comedy open mics like you know usually a lot of the nights uh, like more than one room in the city um every single day basically and then of course all of that shut down once we had the pandemic some things are slowly coming back um but the um but I thought it was important to try and do something on the internet that people could come to that we could kind of still practice and get our, our like try it at least have a goal towards writing some new jokes. And so that's what that is. Um, what has been kind of it, that's really challenging because it's, I don't think it will ever like maybe um, it, it's not going to replace like a live audiences in person things. But what has been really interesting is that I've seen, and not just with this, um, this mic, but with other places, they have, it is able, it has enabled people that maybe wouldn't have tried it to be able to do it. And it also has enabled people that um, have been doing it for a while, to, but maybe don't have the means because stand-up comedy like pays zero dollars. <laughs> if you're basically like it's negative dollars, you usually have to pay you know pay for your gas to go somewhere and do something, and then talk for maybe a, a, like you'd be like I would be grateful to you know drive more than two hours, get to do ten minutes of comedy, and then drive back um, home. Like that would be over the moon to do something like that. Um, but this way, people can you know, pop up and do, uh, do an open mic that is in California that you never would have been able to, and you're meeting other comics, you're seeing lots of other people, people are doing online shows that are excellent materials, like established comedians are doing that. It's wonderful. And also people that have, yeah, that have never done it before, or, um, you know, weren't able to get to places because maybe they have a physical disability and, um, are able to like kind of do as many mics as they wanted. And that, I think is that is amazing and that's really really cool and it's it's going to be interesting to see like in the next couple of years because i think you know the pandemic hopefully is not going to last forever and we're gonna see like maybe this new kind of cohort of comics that have come up from um doing mostly zoom shows and to see what it's like because i think that co like that people were saying for a while, like, stand-up comedy is dead. It's dead. It's like, it's not dead. It's maybe very weird right now, but that's going to produce a different kind of comedy that might be, uh, that's going to produce something different that might be really, really cool. Like, there might be really, really good things that come out of it that I just, like, felt very, like, I, I don't know, it makes me feel very hopeful. And also, I do, um, you know, there's been a couple, of the, the picture on the slide on the left-hand side was actually fairly recently. That's maybe only like a month or two ago, but that was at a distanced outdoor show, which is very, very different than we've done comedy before. That's actually the loading dock of a, of a, of a, of a cidery in town that they turned into a stage to keep kind of keep people away and safe. But um, I think that my comedy, I don't know if it's really like teaching anyone anything except like for how silly I can be sometimes, but it has taught me a lot about engaging other people about listening to other and watching other people too i think it's been the most important part watching people that because i mean this is not something that is my career um i love it it's one of my passions but watching other people do their stand-up and how the how a lot of their comedy is about talking about things that are painful to them and changing it into something that makes them laugh and makes an audience laugh and connection i think is still very much in the heart of a lot of work I did. A really good friend of mine, Winston Hodges, just released a stand-up comedy special. And it's about kind of the comedy that he wrote after his father passed away quite suddenly. And I was watching it and being like, whoa, this is a lot like a lot of the things I'm writing about, about traumatic experiences. It's hilarious. But I also was like, he did a lot of material at his father's graveside, which I thought was, like, I, I was like, I don't know what people are going to think about this because, but it was done in a way, I mean, it's, it's, it's not material that's, um, that is, it's like respectful material. It's, hun it's funny. It's hilarious. But it's also so, I was like, I was crying. because I was like, this is very crying and laughing, which is like, I think sometimes what a lot of these memoir comics do to me too. I was like blown away by it. But I was like, this is really maybe there's some about those both things because people are talking and I feel like to be funny sometimes is a result of trauma so 
Yeah, yeah really, really important. Um, also, just, I mean, you know, I, I don't do stand up, but I can tell you that, um, you know, probably for me, the biggest watershed for my teaching in college was uh, getting up in front of high schoolers and teaching and, you know, these different putting ourselves in these different spaces, you know, asking, you know, really kind of pushing us and to think differently about how we can disseminate learning in our college classrooms, right? I think that's, yeah, that's a really good point. I just also, like, I had a strong visceral reaction right now to that because I I can't imagine teaching in front of high schoolers. I just feel like it would be so hard. Like, I don't know, that to me is so, I think I've also gotten to the age, and I, I, I don't know, I need to work it into a joke or something where we're like, teenagers are terrifying to me like I don't know like I feel like they're just like they're just so savage they're kind of like I'm like they're gonna destroy me they're the youth um but I yeah I also think it it helped me maybe not be because I started doing comedy things because I I knew I wanted to be someone who lectured and someone who talked but I like I've always been painfully shy I've been always very I have so much anxiety and I was like if I don't do stuff like this, I'm never going to be able to do this. Like I'm never going to be able to talk and give a lecture. Um, so I started taking improv classes um, uh, to kind of do this. And I thought like, I was like, I thought, I, I think I'm kind of funny. Um, and so I don't know if I would be able to do even like, especially the virtual teaching right now, if I had not had experiences of not only of like just doing comedy, but of like doing a bad job, like bombing, because it's like, at once you've bombed in front of a whole bunch of people, like if you're talking to a bunch of people on Zoom and no one responds, response, it's just like another day and you can just figure out how to get them. Then I'm like, okay, I have to figure out something different to like get their attention to make sure they're doing the reading. I'm, I'm not going to like take it, per- I'm not going to take it personal, like <laughs> because they have to just keep moving on and keep working and redeveloping, which I think is like kind of the, the strength and kind of beauty of something like even stand up. It's like, you just have to keep going and you have to be like, you have to be fearless because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter that you did a great set, for example, like six month- months ago, who cares? You're only as good as like the last set you did. Yeah. And so that's really kind of maybe changed the way. And now I'm like, whatever, like, let me <laughs> have me teach 150 people on Zoom. I'll do it. They can all to have their cameras off. I will just be lecturing and trying to be interactive as much as I can. Um, yeah, just bring it. <laughs> Well, speaking of audiences, big big audiences and kind of learning spaces, I know that you've been, um, you know, instrumental in kind of help do, with this Comics Arts Richmond. And of course, you also are um, doing things for a small press expo. Why are these particular spaces important for you and for people in general? I think it's so important. Um as um as now that i especially now that i know so many cartoonists it seems like cartoonists and cartooning in general is an incredible it's incredibly labor intensive and anything that is that labor intensive even if you're doing that as a working cartoonist and that is like paying your bills successfully it's still incredibly isolating right like you have to by virtue of your profession be working hours and hours and there are yeah and there's all sorts of complications doing that so it's really important that they have community and it's really also important that we promote people that um that that are doing like what we think of as important work. Um, Small Press Expo is amazing. It's such a great um, great event. I mean, this year we weren't able to have it, but we were still able to do. And I mean, that speaks to kind of the talent of some of the people that are working to make that happen. We were still able to do like a full slate of panels. Um, and of and having cartoonists talk about their work. I think that's really, really important because a lot of times like you can't get all of that information anywhere else besides going to panels. And I think that what is really cool, um, maybe an opportunity of the way you've had to change things, is that all of those are available now on the Small Press Expo's YouTube it's completely free. We did everything, you know, for free. People donated their time because they're wonderful. And, and like anyone can watch all of these things. There's a conversation on, you know, like legal advice. There's conversations on like how people wrote jokes. Like you can, you can learn so much just at your house 
Um, and that can supplement like your other things that you're doing. And I think that's really, really important because I think by far and large, the majority of cartoonists I've ever met have been like some of the nicest, most helpful and encouraging people. And so to share those things with like a greater audience is so important. And I think comics arts rich men, I'm super, super proud of. And um, I mean, I can't do, I can't say anything, but the best things ever for, um, and she created the, the artwork of, um, of scraps that we see on the right of Christine Skelly, who's like my partner, my partner in this, in that we really wanted to do like a, an event that was like small by design. Like we didn't want to make this, this big Comic Con thing anyways in Richmond, but was affordable enough that um, that people could all, that anyone who went could make a profit, um, that anyone who went and presented their stuff could make a profit. And also one that we thought it was really important because we realized we needed someone else to help, that we wanted to make sure we raised enough money that anyone who helped us for like the, the whole, like we had an assistant for the day to do things, like we, we paid him, you know, you know, at least $15 an hour and those, those kind of things. Cause we wanted to be, we want to be, um, you know, a model of the way how things can be run. And that was just a one day only thing that we did last year. We wanted to do it this year. We're not going to, but we are trying to figure out what we can do that would be the most service of the Richmond community for this year. Um, and we've talked about a few things, you know, like doing some streaming things and um, also having maybe some, some like a very small slate of panels for people that maybe their books are coming out this year. Because that's another thing that we're really aware of too is that like book release book release and book signings those aren't really happening this year in the same kind of way like there are some virtual things which is amazing and people should definitely support if you hear about anything because they're not getting to do like even um i mean in general books don't get a lot of money for promotion and publicity but now there's like less than nothing you know because there there's not a venue that you can have that you can't have a book signing and have people come and see see your books which would have been amazing so we're we're trying to figure out like what we can do what we can continue to do because i know probably like um all of us are aware that like we're not probably gonna be out of this um situation anytime soon um yeah really exciting and speaking of the sort of now and the future um, where is the vitality in comics for you and comic studies today? There's so much that I like can't can't like it's it's so much that it's like it's, sometimes it's overwhelming. I haven't even gotten a chance to look at some of the wonderful panels in some of the virtual things. Everyone within comic studies for the most part is just the coolest person in that how they're like okay this isn't working we're gonna figure out how to make this a completely virtual thing we're gonna figure out how to do this in a way that and also i think the um vitality and comics and kind of studies are these people that are um constantly questioning the status quo like the the people that develop like all the women that um developed like the hashtag women on panels to um to um to kind of demand like like that there shouldn't be like panels anymore of academic and academic conferences that are just all men oh, or um like that and also talking about this idea of like of, of ableism that's within things like conferences like that we shouldn't like that this shouldn't happen anymore like we should be able to be as inclusive as possible and that should be baked in from the start not thought of as an afterthought so i see a lot of vitality this way i think um the first person that comes to mind though if i can like name check someone who she would be so embarrassed if i said this but adrian russia to me is like the she's like the she's like the best i um she's um she's the kind of future of comics her the way that she kind of laid out and people haven't looked at the blue age in comics yet like you need to look at um her work and because the way that that was laid out and she like you know so early on in her career and so already so de developed is like the most exciting thing like that is it that is, i was like that this should be in like any sort of comic studies textbook like that should be in there too like she's she's up there with some of the greats but yeah i think there's so much vitality in comics in comic studies it's hard to think about i think about also um if you've not read like um all of the great reportage and critical analyses of going on in soul rad that is some of the best comics writing i've ever read 
and it is so wonderful. And um, so I think that that is definitely like the w- things to look at. I uh, like, there's so many great, wonderful things. Like some of the publishers that I'm, uh, I'm looking at, like just put out the greatest stuff. Like Avery Hill is a big favorite of mine. Um, I don't, yeah, there's just, there's so many, it's never been a more exciting time, I think. Um, um, even a, like Iron, Iron Circus books, I just like think is um, Spike Trotman, I'm such a fangirl of, it's like amazing. Um, so there's just, there's a lot. And there, I think there's a lot too. Um, also, I feel like I always mention like lots of indie things, but there's a lot like even going on with the mainstream comics that is so exciting and so like, so fascinating. And I wanna like, yeah. Um, I wish I could take like a year off just to read because it's like, it's hard to keep up with. Yeah, me too. Oh my goodness. Um, you can't imagine the stack I have over there that I have not been able to get to. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> um, so yeah, what's next for Francesca Lynn? Right now I am, I'm working on kind of a couple of, I'm like chipping away very slowly. I, I gave myself kind of a break of like, oh, this is like not a year like regular years you're probably not gonna like work on a ton of things so um next i am i'm working on a small project with a a small creative project with a friend um that is set in kind of like in it it's it's like an edwardian era magical story (laughs) is what i'm kind of explaining it but it's also kind of us talking about like characters that maybe like are more like us that exist that did exist back in those times but are maybe less depicted within like I don't know Edwardian era film or movies that come out now in 2020 so we're working on that um I'm also um in the beginning stages of working on something with um my comic arts Richmond um partner Christine Skelly we really have wanted to do like some sort of a vampire story for a really long time that is um also a contemporary story but something set within Richmond because we have we have a legendary vampire that that well I guess lives is not the right but we have a legendary vampire in Richmond that like that um supposedly hangs out in Hollywood Cemetery so he yeah he's our friend (laughs) um and but I'm also working on and I have no idea what the um end date is of this or what's going to happen with this. I am working on um, a project that I've really been wanting to work on for a long time, but um, it's kind of an extension of a roundtable talk I gave. Uh, and it's a project on like kind of Pepe the Frog memes, and which is a little bit of a different, a different thing for me to look at, but it is a project definitely in context of, contextualizing like kind of Pepe the Frog memes within kind of um, critical race studies and studies of race and racism and also um, how maybe we can look at the development and response to those memes as um, maybe a model of what to do or, or more importantly what not to do in response to maybe like hateful or racist rhetoric. Yeah so that's like my that's my my thing that I've kind of just been working on on this. I don't know why that's I consider that like for fun. I don't know why I consider that fun. <laughs> but, I love yeah. it. We have to have those um those projects right to keep keep uh, the rhythm varied the texture of our lives varied and um Francesca Lynn, I am like, my mind has been blown. I am so thankful to you for gifting your time, your expertise, your wisdom, and really sharing like why comics matter. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. This is wonderful.